2 on January 26, 2021, and this is the first meeting of the year for the Legislative and Human Resources Committee of the Kent County Board of Commissioners. Welcome, everyone. Uh, would you just introduce the uh, basis for the virtual platform for this meeting, Wayman? Sure. Uh, uh, the uh, statute MCL 15.263A says the Legislative and Human Resources Committee of the Board of Commissioners will conduct this meeting today via electronic communications to protect the health of the public. A member of the public wishing to listen to the proceedings or provide public comment may do so by following the, the internet connection or phone numbers and passcodes that are listed on the agenda. Closed captioning is available via internet connection. Those wishing to provide input or questions in advance of the meeting regarding business to come before the committee may do so by submitting their questions or inputs at public comment at kentcountymi.gov. Anyone disrupting the meeting by using offensive language or actions may be removed from the meeting. All right, thank you. And uh, I guess a special uh, welcome to three of our new members, uh, Commissioner Dan Burrow uh, and Commissioner Melissa LeGrand and Michelle McLeod. This is your first meeting of the Legislative and Human Resources Committee, so welcome. Our first item of business is a public comment. If anyone from the public wishes to address the committee, uh, you may do so in the means and methods uh, that were outlined by um, Wayman Britt, and also by raising your hand or doing an effective way of getting our attention. So you have up to three minutes to address the committee. I do not see any hands raised in chat. Uh, Pam, any other contact from the public? No, there are no messages in the public comment inbox. All right, with that, we will move to item number two, which is approval of the minutes from the December 8, 2020 meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? I'll move to approve those minutes. This is Hennessy. Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Hennessy. Is there support? Support. support. Great. Uh, support by Commissioner LeGrand, I think I heard. Uh, any discussion? Uh, if not, will you take the roll for us, Pam? Sure. Commissioner Burrell? Yes. Commissioner Hennessy? Yes. Commissioner Coleman? Commissioner Coleman? Commissioner LeGrand? Yes. Commissioner McLeod. Commissioner McLeod. Yes. Commissioner Constein. Yes. Commissioner Skaggs. Yes. Commissioner Teal. Yes. Chair Steck. Yes. That motion passes. Very good. We will now move to item number three, which is a presentation by public affairs associate. Is Becky Beckler is here somewhere. There she is, upper right. Good morning, Hi. Becky. Good morning. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you this morning. And welcome to those new members of the committee. I look forward to working with you. Uh, while you see my face most often, I want you to know there are 10 members of Public Affairs Associates. And at any given time, they may be also working on the issues on behalf of the county. Um, another individual that you might see quite often is Scott Breslin, uh, who's another partner of mine, because uh, we work in teams here at Public Affairs Associates. But I wanted to reassure you that uh, it's not just the efforts of myself, but it's an entire uh, network of individuals on working on your behalf. The legislature is now slowly beginning to uh, get itself organized and get ready for the 2021 legislative year. Last Thursday, Speaker Jason Wentworth did release the House committee assignments that I just wanted to mention some of the key assignments uh, with our county delegation I think are going to be important for us as we move forward. Uh, starting with the appropriations, Representative Thomas Albert will be chairing the House Appropriations Committee. Representative Tommy Braun will chair the Veterans and Military Affairs Subcommittee and he is also a member of the Transportation Subcommittee. Representative Rachel Hood is the Minority Vice Chair of Agriculture and Rural Development, but she's also sitting on the DHHS subcommittee. 
Um, Representative Mark Heisinga will now chair the Higher Ed and Community College Subcommittee on Appropriations. Um, on the Policy Committee, Brian, Representative Brian Posthumus will be the Vice Chair of Agriculture. Representative David Legrand will continue as the Minority Vice Chair of Judiciary. He will also serve on the Oversight Committee. Representative Steve Johnson will now chair the Oversight Committee and he's also a member of the House Tax Policy Committee. So we have members on the appropriations as well as key policy committees that we'll be able to network with and work with throughout the next two years. So we look forward to that. There are also a few changes on Senate committees as a result of the recent election. If you'll recall, we had two senators, Senator Pete McGregor and Senator Pete Lucido who took other positions in county government. Therefore, they'll need to replace those positions. Senator Rick Outman appears to be the individual who will take over the Health and Human Services Subcommittee on Appropriations. <clears throat> and also uh, Re Senator Roger Victory will take over as the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, it appears though that we could have a lot of uh, shifting throughout the next year or year and a half as special elections are becoming a little bit more frequent. Um, the governor has announced the special election for those two Senate seats and we've already had uh, I think three representatives announced for those seats. For the Lucido seat, we've had Representative Pam Hornberger and Representative uh, Wozniak already announced that they intend to seek that Senate seat. And for the Senator Lucido seat, uh, Representative Mark Heisinga has announced he uh, plans to seek that seat. There are probably more that will be announcing, but those are what officially. And then as uh, Representative Hamoud from Dearborn plans to uh, run for the Dearborn mayor seat that is a special election. So. There could be more shifting in the near future. I just wanted to bring that up to you as we move forward. Uh, Governor Whitmer also proposed last week a $5.6 billion recovery program. She would like the legislature to advance as quickly as possible. It includes about 575 million of state funds, but 5 billion of federal COVID relief funds that we're looking at. The proposal has includes spending $2 billion on a federal food assistance program, which will increase uh, the benefits by 15%, but also allow more individuals to take advantage of that program. She also would like to provide $2 billion to K through 12 schools, $660 million for an emergency rental relief program, $575 million for COVID testing and tracing program, $90 million for vaccination distribution, $225 million for business relief fund, and $22 million for businesses and residents that were unable to pay their summer taxes. This will help them avoid <clears throat> the interest and penalties that go along with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have been in contact. Uh, thank you to Wayman Britt for allowing us to engage with directly with the governor's office. Um, Elizabeth Hertel, who is now the director of the Department of Human Health and Human Services. I was actually in conversations with her prior to her, that announcement, uh, trying to talk about some relief for Kent County as the expenses I, I, I know have mounted as you uh, go about the vaccine, vaccination program with your um, group of individuals that you're working on the county level. They are open to that. Uh, we also spoke directly with the Senate Majority Leader as they look at a supplemental, and they are also supportive of finding relief for those counties that are doing large vaccination programs. So we look forward to continuing to work with them, but I wanted to let you know that those are two engagements that we've had right away with the legislature as well as the governor's office. This Wednesday evening, Governor Gretchen Whitmer will uh, deliver her third state of the state address. Although it'll be a little bit different than in the prior year, she will be delivering it uh, virtually this year. So that's something that uh, everyone will be able to access at seven o'clock on Wednesday evening. We uh, aren't totally certain what she will talk about, but we're fairly uh, positive that she will talk about the recovery plan that she proposed a week ago, giving it a little bit more detail on what her uh, outline objectives are. She also may talk about her road bonding program. If you recall, she mentioned that last year, but was unable to move that forward. And not only the road bonding program for state roads, but also what are we going to do about local roads? So we'll need to spend uh, some time really unpacking that issue should she bring that up. She also may talk about the learning loss for education of this last year and how are we going to combat that and move forward. Um, she also, I'm assuming, will talk about the 
vaccination efforts in the state and how we can continue to help um, hospitals and local health departments continue uh, down that path of progress. We believe also that the governor plans to introduce her budget two weeks after the state of the state. So uh, we will get up and running very quickly uh, with both the policy as well as the, the budget when she announces that. And as I referenced before, uh, Elizabeth Hurtel is now the director of the Health and Human Services. She will replace Robert Gordon, who resigned on Friday. Uh, she is a friend of Kent County. She uh, has worked closely with us uh, and uh, Wayman Britt knows her well. So I think that is a, a benefit to the, to the county that we have direct access to somebody who's familiar with the county and our issues. That's what I have this morning. I would be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Very good. Thank you, Becky. Uh, any questions or comments from commissioners? So while they're thinking, um, Becky, a couple of questions. I mean, I would love to have the inside story on uh, Robert Gordon's resignation, if you have it, but um, you probably don't. <laughs> No, I, I don't. I could speculate, but I'll pass. <laughs> yeah, all right. But um, in underscoring your observation that uh, uh, his replacement is, uh, is a really good positive development for our county. So that is good. Uh, any thoughts on uh, whether under the new um, proposed uh, relief package from the state, what role, if any, counties would have in allocations of that process? Well, I think that is still to be determined. Um, in talking with both the Senate Majority Leader as well as the Speaker of the House, um, both are going to be taking a little bit different tactic. There was frustration that the administration did not give them any advance warning that the governor was going to be proposing this. So there's a little bit of hard feelings going into this. However, both the House and the Senate appear to be working on a um, supplemental. So I think something will be moving forward. And, and as I said before, I believe strongly that both the administration as well as the House and Senate will be including uh, funding for counties, um, specifically for the vaccine effort. But I think once um, we start to understand the parameters for both the House, the Senate, as well as the governor, there could be other venues in which the county could access those funds, whether it be on that the food program or some rate relief for the renters. We need to, as soon as the governor's office has more detail on what they are proposing and how the Senate and the House react, I think we need to get more specific as to how that could benefit the counties. Yeah, okay, good. Um, Commissioner Ponstein, you have your hand up. Good morning, Becky, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Well, you're safe at home. You didn't have to travel across the state in the snow right. to get here, so that's good. Just a couple quick things. I mean, you know, I know it's the beginning of the year and we're just getting started. So the president did the executive order to kill the Keystone pipeline, and I don't have any real comments on that. But what, if any, affects would that be to our line five? And could anything like that be done just to shut it down with a signature? You know, that's an excellent question that I would be happy to ask one of my partners for the answer since he works directly on that issue. I do believe that the governor may talk in her state of the state about litigation with regard to line five, as you, as you recall, that is in litigation as well. But let me find out whether that is something that uh, either the president could do and what that reaction would be. That's an excellent question. Okay, and then the other thing, kind of more of a bigger scope and, you know, when a, a situation like COVID occurs, uh, it takes our mind off of other things. Where are we at, and I know some of this is a federal issue, but where are we at with making sure that the maintenance and the upkeep and a possible addition to the Sioux locks, where is that progressing? And then also the same thing with the bridge to Canada. Uh, both of those have, uh, you know, immense impacts on trade and commerce for the state of Michigan. Can you get maybe someone to maybe just update what if anything we're hearing? I know a lot of that money's been allocated, but I don't know if it's going to be 
something that can be pulled from that or not? Yes, absolutely. Let me see if I can get you um, a short briefing on all of those three issues for you by the end of the week. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? All right, well, good. This is probably as easy as you will have it, Becky. <laughs> I agree, this might be my high watermark. <laughs> as we get into what's likely to be a challenging year, uh, I suspect yes. that um, these will be a little more um, um, a little more detailed. So anyway, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. All right, let's move to item number four, which is a performance measurements review submitted to us by our clerk, Lisa Postumas Lyons. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, I will let Natasha get the PowerPoint up and ready to go. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Just ask for a little bit of patience and forgiveness and grace um, with me presenting um, here in my office and Natasha presenting not in my, or presenting the PowerPoint, <laughs> it not in my office. Um, it, we may have moments of some clunky transition, but um, I assure you the content is well worth it. Natasha, are you all ready to go? All okay, thank you. So um, just an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, I'll briefly share how our, uh, how our office is structured, uh, how our office is structured, um, our leadership and our goals, um, mostly for the benefit of our new commissioners. Um, you have in your packet our complete performance metrics um, measurements. So I'm not really gonna focus much on the performance measurements, but rather on our top line statistics um, just so you get a good feel for um, what we handle annually and our significant accomplishments over the last two years. Reminder, this is a um, per, uh, presentation on um, an update from both 2019 and 2020. So uh, with the elections last year um, being so hot and heavy, we just simply didn't have a chance to be able to present our 2019 measurements um, in 2020, but I think that worked out well for all, um, you know, the administration and myself, given that, that we had a transition to a new software system for performance measurements. We had um, dealing with our COVID and work from home and things like that. So um, I think that uh, this being able to present both years is um, really uh, the best way we could have done this this year. Um, and then I will finish up with just a look ahead for what we expect for this year, 2021. Natasha, if you wanna switch slides. Um, many of you are familiar with the clerk's office um, and mostly elections, but my office covers a wide range of important uh, functions for county government. Um, I like to say that people interact with our office at every major milestone in life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, we deal with vital records. We deal with elections. I serve as the clerk of the 17th Circuit Court. <clears throat> and in Kent County, we have a combined office. Um, so I also serve as register of deeds. My chief deputy is Rob McCumber, who previously served with me as my chief of staff in the legislature uh, and came to the county at the same time I did in 2017. Um, go ahead to slide four, Natasha. This is a breakdown of each of our offices and the highlights of what we handle. Um, I've been really blessed with a tremendous leadership team. Um, in addition to having Rob handle vital records, Jared Uzarski is our elections director um, and he is one of the most respected elections director in, in the state of Michigan. We're very happy to have him and his expertise. Um, I think anybody dealing with elections after 2020 probably deserves some hazard pay. <laughs> It's just, it was great to have a very successful November election um, administratively. Uh, Jerry Chaya has been with the county for more years than I can remember. Um, and he is another very well-respected voice among his peers around the state for register of deeds, um, land records management and recording issues. Um, and so we are just so blessed to have Jerry. He's been, like I said, um, He's been with our office for, I don't know. Jerry, um, are you on the line? How many years have you been with us? Been I know he's- 23. 
23 years. I wanted to say decades, but I'm not sure. I do know that he is counting down the days to retirement, right, Jer? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're just really glad to have top-notch um, leadership in our uh, Register of Deeds office. Uh, Amy Doring is our Chief Deputy in the incredibly busy uh, Clerk of the Court's office, and she previously served with the county um, in the Friend of the Court office. She does a great job balancing the autonomy um, of the Clerk's office with the fun how it functions in many ways within the Circuit Court structure. Um, so we're just so glad to have her. And finally, Kim Perry is my assistant and the staff who you as commissioners are uh, most likely to be familiar with as she handles the board minutes and proceedings. Um, additionally, we have a great group of management and union staff members from uh, both the UAW and TPOAM. They serve the public daily and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how this office could not function without the professionalism and the dedication of this staff, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Do you wanna to move to slide five, Natasha? Um, these are the department um, strategic goals for our office. They essentially um, say that we will do the work that we're statutorily mandated to perform and that we'll perform those duties well and within um, certain timeframes uh, mandated. Um, if you wanna to move to slide six. These are um, some of our vital metrics. The next few slides are kind of designated to give you an idea of the volume of the workload that we handle. Um, for our vital records office, the number of new records filed in 19, you'll see in the middle, um, and the number of records filed in 2020. Uh, the last line, um, these are, uh, we don't have the number of records that were requested um, from 2019. I, we had, we, we didn't, we lost that with the previous software, but for 2020, um, You'll see that all of these um, all of these filings um, are in addition to the requests uh, of nearly fifty eight thousand two hundred requests for existing records. Um, just to have a little bit of a notation here, you'll notice that we had a decline in from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty in marriage licenses, and that's due to the um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a time uh, when we weren't able to issue marriage licenses, but we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up as well. Um, and then you'll notice in, uh, in the second to the last uh, column, we had a huge increase in CPLs. And that's very common in times of unrest or uncertainty. Anytime we have an election year, we see a little, we see a bump in, um, in CPL uh, applications. Um, we have riots in 2020, we had the pandemic. And so I think um, all of these factors contributed into this significant um, jump in, uh, in our CPLs. Uh, talking with my peers throughout the state, this is not unique to Kent County. This is something we've seen across the board in Michigan. Um, if you wanna move to slide seven, these are our elections metrics. We held three elections in both 19 and 20. In fact, we always hold three elections. There's never been a time in my tenure um, that we haven't had um, a May election. So uh, most voters, when they think of elections, they think every four years, um, but in Kent County, we do have an election at every statutory, um, statutorily uh, allowed um, opportunity. Um, and then in presidential years, we obviously have four um, until, they, until the uh, legislature and if they ever change uh, how we do our um, presidential nominee uh, selections. Um, so again, there's never any downtime in elections, uh, even though it doesn't seem like they're, they're on the forefront. They are certainly um, they are certainly a huge uh, undertaking in our office throughout the entire year, every year. Um, if you want to move to slide eight, <clears throat> the, uh, these are our register um, of deeds metrics. 
In 2019, the Register of Deeds office was trending on track with previous years. Our workflow there is largely, obviously, largely dependent on the real estate market, interest rates, and things like that. Um, the story in 2020 is different, however. We've seen, um, we've seen the busiest year in that office since 2006. Um, low interest rates, loan modification documents due to, um, you know, due to the fluctuating um, real estate market um, have all made for a busy recording year. And historically, we've always hit our, um, our metrics with how quickly we've recorded our documents, um, which has always been within five days. But due to COVID and staffing modifications, plus the increased volume um, of our documents to be recorded, we're um, just over 30% recorded within five days and mostly um, within 15 to 20. So um, the pandemic has kind of uh, created, a, I wouldn't call it a backlog, um, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly not the uh, pace uh, in which we are accustomed to in the Register of Deeds office. Um, but our staff, is, our staff is working hard every day um, to make sure that we are uh, playing our role, which is key to the, um, to the financial uh, sector of our economy. Um, if you want to move to slide nine, these are our court metrics. Um, and this slide will give you a good picture <clears throat> of the number of cases filed uh, within our court office um, and the number of cases that are, uh, I'm sorry, the number of documents that are filed in our court office and the number of cases that are opened annually. Um, there's an enormous figure that speaks to a busy office. Uh, you'll notice in 2020, the decline in cases in uh, last year was obviously, again, indicative of having um, to make adjustments and having some of these uh, in-person hearings and trials halted as well. Um, if you want to move to slide 10, Natasha, moving on to our 2019 significant accomplishments, uh, our vital records uh, division and our deeds office transitioned from circa 2000 records management database system to a more compatible system uh, for modern day needs um, for our land and vital, vital records management. We purchased our new system, which was Tyler Technologies, uh, using 100% automation funds. Um, that is our uh, technology um, fund in the Register of Deeds office. We collect $5. Um, this isn't unique to Kent County. This is um, per statute, per state law. We collect $5 from every uh, recording document um, that goes into the automation fund, which is to be used to um, upgrade and to be able to stay current with technology in that office. Um, we have an easy interface for uh, the public to search and um, that's really helped during uh, the COVID pandemic when customers needed um, access um, and they could get that access online. Uh, this this um, new system of ours will allow for implementation uh, to use kiosk services um, they're beautiful. They're just not out. We can't use them until uh, until we kind of get through this COVID-19 pandemic and people are um, able to touch things and <laughs> that kind of um, that kind of issue again. Um, but we do know that these kiosk services will be a tremendous help um, and asset to our uh, customer service for our the public and to also make things uh, run e smoothly and efficiently for our staff. Um, and it will, we hope, cut down on paper applications. Uh, moving to slide 11, our 2020 significant accomplishments. Um, I'm really proud to uh, share that we, we had minimal interruption in all of our services during the pandemic. Um, we, were, we were closed to in-person for almost three months, but our staff reported um, or reduced and rotated shift so that we could continue um, providing essential services to our public. Um, we did this at that time through uh, mail and online services. 
And the only services that were interrupted were um, our marriage licenses and our CPLs, which required in-person oath and ID verification. However, we were able to, <clears throat> I think around uh, the end of April or May, we were able to, um, with Rob's research, de devise a um, by mail marriage application where customers could be issued an oath by a notary instead of our clerks. So we were able to resume marriage licenses um, in early, yeah, early May. Um, we couldn't make that work for CPLs at the time because uh, we have, you know, it's not just my office that interacts. We have, um, we have fingerprinting that we were dealing with with the sheriff's office um, and, uh, you know, they weren't open to the public and then had to be open by appointment as, as time went on. Um, and then we also had um, <clears throat> the Michigan State Police doing um, their background checks and such. However, um, we got to a point where we were going to um, begin providing those services when, when we opened up anyway. So um, we were getting to a point, had we stayed closed, we were going to explore how we would provide these services, but we didn't get to that, uh, we didn't get to that stage. Um, moving on to um, slide 12. Much of 2020 was uh, monopolized by elections. Um, first, we were able to implement our new campaign finance management software that allows better transparency for the public and will allow easier administration and compliance enforcement on our end. That was something that we began in 2019 and um, was really kind of brought to a near full fruition um, in 2020. We're still working with our vendor um, or potentially a new vendor if, uh, if the circumstances require to aid in the electronic submission of reports. Similar to the MERT system at the state level, uh, we just wanna get to a point where candidates um, don't need to create papers and mail them or hand deliver them. Uh, we do accept our, uh, our paper, um, we do accept our paper filings electronically um, through email. Uh, which hasn't been done in, um, in previous 10 years. Um, but we think it's important to um, really have a, have a system that can be um, filed electronically. <clears throat> and so that we were supposed to have in June um, of last year. But again, um, you know, the, the pandemic kind of put all of that uh, to the wayside. And hopefully we'll be able to get those um, up and running in time for for this year, but um, certainly everything um, working um, flawlessly for the 2022 elections. Um, <clears throat> if you want to move to slide 13, <clears throat> we did, um, given that this was an interesting year with uh, post proposal three um, provisions, uh, presidential election, and the pandemic. Um, we really thought it was important to um, make sure our voters had the information um, that they need uh, that they needed to be able to vote um, to be able to vote safely and securely. So um, we knew they would have lots of questions and concerns about the voting process. So we were able to utilize CARES Act funds uh, to launch a, um, a voter education and outreach can uh, effort where we used social media and radio advertisements, as well as a teletown hall. Um, we did two, one um, specifically for Grand Rapids where we, um, we had Clerk Joel Hondorp <clears throat> join me and we had another one for the, uh, the rest of the county. Um, and that was our ability to connect one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, with our voters to allow them to ask questions of myself um, in Grand Rapids case of Clerk Hondorp, of uh, Jared, our elections director, and just to reassure them that voting in Kent County is safe, secure, and transparent. We reached about 200,000 uh, Kent County voters through social media. We ran um, 1,100 radio ads on four different radio stations and contacted 40,000 voters to engage in the teletown hall <clears throat> where we were able to interact and take those questions. What we didn't know was how much voter education we'd need to do after election day, uh, but this was a very successful um, pre-election outreach effort. 
Um, I do hope to continue something along these lines in future elections, um, should our financial resources provide the ability to do so. Um, moving on to slide 14. Along with our, uh, with our uh, voter education and outreach campaign, um, we knew that would drive more traffic to our uh, elections website. And so we made improvements. We are now using the kentcountyvotes.com uh, address instead of kind of the clunkier accesskent.com slash clerk slash elections. Um, we wanted voters to be able to have something catchy that they could remember that they could access immediately. Um, <clears throat> and then if you want to move to slide 15, Natasha, um, we were able to uh, also make um, some modifications to our website to add Dropbox location for every jurisdiction. Dropboxes aren't new um, to Kent County or to Michigan, but they were certainly much more, um, much more promoted. And some of our areas who, who didn't have Dropboxes in the past did take advantage of, um, of that option for um, making sure we, our voters had a way to, uh, a way to vote comfortably and safely. Um, I guess I can take a moment uh, right now. I thought I'd open it up to questions at the end, but um, this might be a good time to kind of go over some of our election statistics for uh, November, 2020. We had um, 501,117 registered voters, um, which is almost 50,000 more registered voters this election than we had in 2016. Um, of that, we had a 72% voter turnout, almost 73%. We had 363,695 voters participate in this election. Um, <clears throat> we had 22796 absentee ballot ballots issued. And of those ballots issued, we had 214 2,286 absentee ballots cast. That is um, a 94% um, return rate for our absentee ballots, which is um, very good. I wasn't expecting as high of a return rate this year, what with um, the unsolicited sending of applications, but it, see, it, it turned out to be relatively in line with what we've seen for return rate in the past. Um, maybe a, a touch lower, but nothing significant. Um, we had 59% of our voters um, cast their ballots absentee versus 41% um, who cast their ballots in the precincts on election day. To give you um, a little perspective and context to that, um, in the November 2016 election, um, we were dealing with 22% of um, voter participation via absentee ballots versus 78% in the precincts. I don't believe we will go back to um, much lower uh, than 50% um, of our voters voting absentee now with proposal free um, in full effect. Um, but I don't know that we'll take, I, I don't expect that, I do expect that um, 2020 will likely be a high watermark um, for absentee voting given that there was a pandemic. You know, we had somewhat 60 to 70% of our voters um, in the May and August elections uh, took advantage of absentee voting, 59%, so it was a jump down in the general election. So uh, possibly the high watermark, but certainly um, absentee voting is um, going to be a significant, uh, a much more significant method of casting ballots than what it has been in the past. Um, if you want to move to uh, slide 16. This is our uh, kind of post-election um, uh, post election efforts. I am very proud of our local clerks, our city or township clerks, all of the, um, all of the folks who came out and worked on election day of our staff. Um, election day went very, very well. It was a, it was a very smooth election day, um, and uh, probably the best election we've had, um, the best large election we've had as far as um, minimal uh, problems or issues during election day, and certainly nothing that wasn't remedied immediately. Um, 
We had zero recounts requested. We had no recounts requested. We spent November and December combating dis and misinformation and educating the public on our checks and balances and reassuring um, the public that Kent County elections are secure, they're accurate, and they're transparent. We did an audit of 22 precincts um, from election day uh, and absentee precincts. So um, the state will have us do um, 10 randomly selected precincts um, for a procedural audit. I did not believe that, um, I felt that it was important that we had a precinct audited in Grand Rapids because it's our largest uh, city. And, um, and so because that wasn't one of our randomly selected um, precincts by the state, we coordinated with uh, Clerk Hondorp, who was very, um, very uh, interested and um, co uh, cooperative. He wanted to make sure that we did the audit as well. So we added an 11th precinct. And so it makes 22 because essentially our in-person voting and our um, absentee voting are um, kind of separate, separated. So there are precincts within themselves. Um, these audits proved that our election results were accurate and that our elections were administered according to law. The results of the audit are public um, and they are on our website. Every audit report is available on kentcountyvotes.com. Uh, we also invited, just as we did with the Canvas, um, with the Canvas process, we invited the media and the public to attend um, because we were making sure that everything we do in elections in Kent County is transparent. Um, I have and will continue to be active in providing the legislature accurate information about how we run our elections in Kent County. And I do expect to see reform bills in the next few months. Um, there's all, while our elections are secure, there are always things that we can do to improve the integrity of our elections. If you wanna to move to um, slide 15, or I'm sorry, slide 17, um, just a quick look ahead in terms of what we expect for uh, this year. We do have a uh, budget challenge that is going, that is forming the Supreme, we have recently, very recently found out that the Supreme Court has said we can no longer charge for name searches um, in our court on the county website. We were charging $6 to um, uh, locate names associated with court cases. The public, it was uh, something that the public um, utilized extensively. Uh, but um, we will continue to provide that service, though we will not be able to charge for that. And that will be about a $1 million hit to the general fund revenue. Um, I expect to be having conversations um, to kind of further discuss this with, um, with Director Dode and Marvin. Um, we are looking into expanding services here in the clerk's office. Um, especially particularly to include fingerprinting in-house of our CPLs. A lot of other counties provide that service. Um, I think it's, um, it's something we can do here in Kent County that would be an added benefit to our, um, to our residents, our, our customers, um, kind of making a one-stop shop, uh, a one-stop shop service. Um, and also we've, we're exploring passports. Um, currently we send those uh, who come in and, and ask for those services to city hall or the post office. Um, we have just kind of begun that, um, that exploration and um, haven't just quite decided if, the, uh, if it's um, something that we should definitely provide, um, but do expect to see expanded services uh, on fingerprinting in the clerk's office. Unless, um, unless circumstances change. Um, obviously, looking ahead again, I uh, expect to have three elections in Kent County um, in 2021. We'll have the May election. Um, so far, we have, I think, one school who has, uh, will have something on the ballot. The deadline for that um, is February 9th, I believe, to have um, something put on the May ballot. Uh, we will have the August election, which will be for our cities, um, their primary, and also the special election in the 28th Senate um, seat primary. And then we'll have the November election for the special 28th general 
and um, our city general elections. Um, and obviously looking ahead, I, um, I expect to see election law reforms. If you wanna to move to slide 18, we did launch um, again with, with our uh, voter education and outreach effort. Um, we were pretty casual about my social media, um, but we did launch more of an official social media effort. Um, we were previously just using my public official page. Now we have <clears throat> um, follow at County Clerk on both Facebook and Twitter. Um, we put our latest updates on that, on um, those social media. Uh, and with that, so I encourage you to um, hop on those, those social media sites and stay updated. And um, with that, I have concluded our update for 2019 and 2020, Mr. Chair. Um, I can take questions if you, if you would like. Very good. Well, thank you for your report. I think next to our health department, you're probably in the hottest seat. So um, we appreciate all the work and, and clearly uh, the incredible effort in steering us through um, a somewhat tumultuous election cycle. Thank you. All right, commissioners, um, if you have questions or comments, uh, please raise your hand. I see Commissioner Burrell, you raised your hand first. Uh, yes, uh, Lisa, I'd just like to thank you for a, a well-run uh, 2020 uh, election year with everything that was going on. Again, not only uh, did you provide safe, secure elections, it was well-organized. I'd like to thank your staff and also uh, your working relationship with uh, our city clerks and township clerks. Uh, I know they appreciate you and a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner of the Grant. Uh, well, I will definitely echo those sentiments and want to give a shout out to Jared, who I know really uh, just worked so hard to make sure everything goes well. Um, who could have foreseen how unpleasant it all was in the aftermath of the election, but to know that everything was done so well was, was great. I assume when you say audits, you're talking about an actual recount. Is that how you know that those precincts were accurate? Thank you for the question, Commissioner. Um, what we do in our audits, <clears throat> again, the state sends uh, 10 randomly selected um, precincts. So the number is based on the population in each county. So Kent County will have, you know, some counties may only have three precincts, but because we're a larger county, we'll have the most, we'll have um, kind of one of the most uh, largest amounts of precincts to audit. And when we audit those, we do a procedural audit where we go through and check, um, you know, election day procedures. We'll count to make sure, uh, we'll count um, absentee ballot applications. We'll do, we just make sure that our, we make sure that um, another example is that uh, we have a Republican and a Democrat working our polls that they were, that all of our election workers had um, certifications of training, um, you know, that kind of thing that we, that we were transparent and notified the public of our, um, of our public testing of our equipment, um, that we notified the public that there is an election, you know, things like that. Um, and then part of that, uh, part of that audit does include a recount in the, of paper ballots in those precincts. Um, the state asked us to recount um, the United States Senate race in each of our precincts. Um, and given the attention drawn um, to this election and the presidential results, uh, I was not going to do a recount of uh, paper ballots without also recounting the presidential election as well. So in Kent County, we did a full hand recount in each of these precincts of the United States Senate seat as well as the president of the United States election. Wow, that, that's great to know, thank you. Uh, two other little technical questions. I, um, when you had the divisions of your office up there, um, I know what the FTE stands for, but what does MPP stand for in those? Another good question, sorry for my um, bureaucratic language. Uh, FTE, full-time employees, MPP, those staff are on our management payment plan. Uh, um, they are they are our non-union um, our non-union employees. They, so they aren't represented um, by a collective collective bargaining union. Oh, interesting. Okay. 
And then another question about the concealed weapons permits. Is that just for applications or are those actual permits issued? Um, those are, I'm pulling up my slide here. The annual figure would also include uh, renewals. Oh, for the so weapons? They, okay. So they're renewals and app, um, renewals and licenses issued, correct? So they are issued. Okay, thank you. That's it. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Steck. Thank you for being here today, Clerk Lyons. I've got two different questions. I'll just ask them separate. The first has to do with documents. I know over the years when we've kind of moved to more services available online, we saw the switch of how we process those. Um, with the COVID-19 over the past year, with more people working from home, not wanting to go out, did you see an uh, uptick that we could uh, say that was because of COVID that we saw an uptick of documents or did it pretty much stay the same? And then the bigger question is if trends are going more online, uh, how does the staffing of the clerk's office look five years from now? That's a good question. So with regard to our documents, we did see an uptick in, in our mail um for our services particularly in vital records um but again it wasn't it wasn't a huge uptick i think a lot of folks rather than rather than mail their documents or, or whatever would do um just maybe delayed coming in um and i think we'll know more as we as we look at our monthly statistics um this year compared to compared to uh last year but um, we have in our register of deeds office, we've, we've been roughly 50 to 60% of, um, of our recording documents have been um, e-recorded. Uh, we have obviously seen those increase um, more anecdotally. I don't have necessarily, um, uh, I don't have the empirical numbers off the, you know, off the top of our head, but we definitely saw a transition to more um, online uh, or mail services. But I will say when we've opened back up, we don't do appointments only. We are full service every day, eight to five, um, with the exception of our court office. They, we've, kept, um, we've kept those hours and things kind of more consistent with what the circuit court is doing, um, simply because it, it's, uh, more, it's consistent for their um, operations over there. Um, but since we've opened, we have a continual study stream of in-person customers. It's not um, always what it what it used to be, but you know it's it always fluctuates. Um, as far as the staffing um, implications that that moving to more online um, services has, I haven't. We are um, very. I don't want to say no. I will say it. We are pretty. Mi we're very minimally staffed for the volume and the workload that we do here um, in Kent County, particularly compared to some other counties. Um, <clears throat> and so by nature of what we have to do and the fact that we are um, an in-person service provider, we continue to be an in-person service provider, I don't foresee having a huge impact on um, staffing levels over the next five years because services um, may be requested online but we still need our staff to be able to um, um, input the data that comes from our birth records, that comes from our death record systems from the state. Um, there's still a whole host of things that happen on the back end, um, kind of uh, behind the curtain that require um, you know, manual personal effort. Okay, thank you. Then the other one, <clears throat> has to do with, with elections. And it's very similar to the question that I just asked is that, you know, I don't think it's a fad that people are voting by mail. I think it's a trend that's gonna continue. So having, using that as the assumption, as we move to more mail-in voting instead of in-person, 
what do you think five years from now our precincts are going to look like? I mean, are we going to have precincts that are open with six people running the election? And we have a fraction of the volume that we have today. How do we balance that cost wise if, if we're going to be moving to a mail in system? Well, I, that's a really good question. <clears throat> and I first I will tell you that I think we will always have precincts. I think there's, um, you know, uh, people with disabilities um, issues if we were to go to um, closing down precincts. Um, we need to be open for people with who have disabilities to be able to use our accessible um, our accessible uh, equipment. Um, there are people who fundamentally will not vote um, by mail. There are people who like to go to the polls. And I know you know this, but my point is, I think we will always have polls open um, and what they look like um, will have to be a matter of, um, of great discussion because they'll continue to operate the way they do, regardless of whether one person shows up or not, or um, a thousand people show up in the precinct, simply because um, they're operated by, um, by statute. So um, everything that we do is pretty much statutorily mandated. So until we um, maybe reduce or expand the size of the population size for precincts, if we get to that point, um, but we, we have to be mindful that precincts will always be a part of our system simply because we'll have, we'll have um, and, and they'll have to be easily accessible for those who have transportation issues, things like that. that um, but like I said, I think, I think the precincts will, um, may look different, but I think we'll always have people going to the polls. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McLeod, you had your hand up. Thank you, Chair Seth. I my question was answered by the clerk um, in some by, via someone else's question, but thank you for your um, for your uh, presentation. It was very informative. So uh, definitely, thank you for um, tailoring it a little bit for the newbies that are on the call today. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you. Seth. That's all I have. All right. Good. Uh, anyone else? Don't see any other hands up, so I, I guess that's when I get to. I'm sorry. I have my hand up. This is Carol. Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. That's okay. See that? Yes, Commissioner Hennessy. I have a question about your phone system. So sometimes you did, you don't, you know, you had periods where you didn't have the office open. But how is your phone system working? I've had some difficulty on occasion with it. Sorry, I'm writing down. <clears throat> Our phone system generally, generally we have people where there there's never been a time when the clerk's office was not open. Um, so we have always had people here, particularly, especially in our vital records, in our deed, in our elections, in our deeds office, we did um, rotating shifts, same thing with our, um, with our circuit court office. There's never been a time when any, all of our staff has been working from home or that our office was closed to the public. So we've always been here to answer the phones. Um, sometimes that gets to, um, it gets to where, because we have, um, we have employees serving um, at the counter. Um, at the same time, we're getting multiple calls. Uh, we aren't able to physically answer them all. So they'll go into a phone service, um, admittedly. It's um, aging technology, and we need a new system very, very soon. Um, I do know the county IT has been working on up updating uh, the county phone systems. Um, so we just we do our best with the uh, staffing that we have, with the phone system that we have. And hopefully, as um, you know, if it's complicated or, or clunky to, to not have somebody answer the phone on our end. I assure you that we take great steps to make sure anybody who leaves a message or who contacts our office that we are aware of that did not get um, that did not get a personal phone um, a personal answer uh, to their phone call will be contacted and called back immediately as soon as possible. But this is also something that is being addressed 
with, yes. with within, you know, our IT or, our, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's not, it, there, it's not just the system that we use here in the clerk's office. It's the countywide system. And I think everybody is in agreement that it's, it's aged and out, outlived its, um, outlived its benefit and we'll be looking to improve that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, Lisa, I have just a couple for you. Uh, as you know, I hang around in relatively nefarious circles called the Bar Association. And um, the question I get most often is, uh, what is the current schedule for moving to electronic filing across the board in our court system? Um, my own personal experience, I'm pretty sure that Wayne and Oakland, I think uh, Macomb, and now Ottawa County are all uh, fully online with electronic filing. Are we, how close are we and what's the schedule for getting there? Uh, thank you for answering that question. I um, know to expect that question from you every time <laughs> I this report. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Amy in just a minute to maybe provide a little more detail, but um, the schedule was to be um, implemented on um, <clears throat> e-filing in 2017 to 2018. So that was the schedule. Um, some of those counties that you mentioned were part of a pilot uh, process. Um, the Ottawa, I think, I think um, Oakland, they were part of a pilot um, that at one point I don't believe went so well. Um, we are and have been doing e-filing on our um, SBD, our specialized business dockets. Um, but I think, uh, I think, you know, we continue to work with our court administration um, to be prepared for the implementation of e-filing and those, those conversations are ongoing. And I'd, I'd like to introduce Amy, if I may, to just kind of maybe provide the latest and greatest on um, where we're at. And I'm sorry, but it's not where we want to be. Right. Correct, good Thank morning. Yes. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, I will echo what Lisa has said. Uh, we have had been working with the state to uh, jump on board to their initiative for e-filing. Um, it turns out the circuit court in tandem with the clerk's office, uh, we're creating our own process for e-filing. Uh, right now, as Lisa mentioned, our business docket is, uh, is up and running for the e-filing purposes. We are slowly moving toward um, divorce cases, personal protection orders. And during the pandemic, we did offer one version of e-filing for um, ex parte motions. Um, so for those who don't run in the bar association group, um, things that would be emergent in nature or should be decided upon without hearing, we did take those, uh, those types of motions during the pandemic electronically or via email so that we could provide that level of service um, even though our doors were closed for some time. So we are working together. Um, the court did just hire a project manager who will oversee some of these projects in, in addition with our office participating. So moving forward, definitely not where we wanna be and definitely are seeing that the pandemic has made this even more necessary um, and we would all benefit from it, even, even our office. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. So is there a new prevailing uh, target date um, that we can tell folks is, uh, is what we're shooting for? I don't have a target date. Um, we, we have been working on our business docket while it's not quite paperless, it's, it's been running and for years. Um, I think we should have more answers as soon as the um, project manager for the court is working more closely with our office. Um, so there, there isn't a target date as of right now, unfortunately, either if we were to work with the state, I don't believe there's even a target date there. And there isn't a target date for our entire uh, docket to become electronic. Um, that might take a little bit of time, which is why we're sort of doing it in a piecemeal process with each case okay. type as we go. Right, Commissioner, I think um, as time went on and target with dealing with the statewide, um, the state with their e-filing uh, implementation and as targets continued to be missed, I think they just kind of gave up giving us targets because every time we got there, it was you know, a, a letdown. And so we haven't, dates have not been 
part of the equation in, in quite some time. Yeah, I think uh, part of the um, angst maybe at the Bar Association is that we it works so well with the business document. Um, and so the question is, if we can do it with such speed and, and it's so smooth at the business docket, why not expand it to the rest of the docket? And I know you're working hard at it and it's not as simple as flipping the switch, but I um, encourage you to continue to, uh, because it is a point that at least in the circles I run that um, people raise their hand and say, what's, what's wrong with Kent County? Why can't we get on, on board? Great. All right, any other questions, comments for Lisa? If not, uh, thank you, Lisa, and the rest of your team for being here this morning and for, um, for steering us through some very difficult issues uh, over the last year or years now with your report and uh, look forward to uh, more accomplishments over the coming year. Thank you thank, again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I very much appreciate the time. And as you know, we are um, we try to be accessible um, at all times. If anybody ever has any questions or, or needs more information, we're happy to provide that. Great, very good. Okay, let's move to the next item, number five, which is a uh, proposed resolution from the health department. Wayman? Yes, this is a recommendation to the board of commissioners to add one full-time public health nurse position for the fetal infant mortality program. The health department has received funding from the Ready by Five Millage Services to hire a full-time fetal infant mortality review coordinator and reestablish the FEMER program for Kent County. A total of $125,000 in funding has been made available for, for the 12 months beginning January 1, 2021 through December 31, 2021. The county's FEMER program will closely follow the model as established by the state of Michigan Michigan Department of Health and Human Services describes FEMER as an evidence-based process of identification and analysis of factors that contribute to fetal and infant death. The FEMER coordinator will utilize a network of connections formed by Ready by Five to provide greater awareness of data surrounding child deaths in the county and to contribute to better prevention and intervention activities for children aged zero to five. The annual cost of salary and benefits for the new position is $90,800. The grant will also cover a portion of the cost for a public health program supervisor of $13,200, as well as travel supplies, software, and indirect costs of $20,800. The grant period is January 1, 2021 to December 31, 2021. If funding is eliminated or increased, the position will be eliminated unless continuation funding is approved pursuant to the fiscal policy on grants, contracts, and donations. There's uh, in the packet a letter from uh, the folks at uh, First Steps and Maria Valdez that uh, goes into a little bit more detail. All right, excellent. Thank you. Is there a motion to uh, approve? Moved by Ponstein. Second by Skaggs. Moved by Commissioner Ponstein and seconded by Commissioner Skaggs. And I note that this is this is the one year, this, this year's grant and the indication that there'll be another application for next year. And I think that uh, Commissioner LeGrand, you had your hand up. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering if there's someone who can give me the history. We're talking about reestablishing um, this this position or this um, this pursuit, and I'm wondering when we last had it and how it was funded at that time. Sure. All right. Thank, I think have... Teresa Branson is here. Is she going to respond to that? Yes, I can respond to that. Yes, thank you. Um, this position was originally um, housed at Spectrum Health, Healthier Communities, and the position in the program has been around for a number of years, probably 25 plus years. Um, there was some um, conversations between Dr. Adam London and the leadership at Spectrum Health Healthier Communities um, in terms of fit for where this type of position and this type of initiative should fall. The health department for a number of years has been working on many different initiatives that have also come before the board here to address um, infant mortality. Um, and also a lot of the um, work that the health department does through years on data and surveillance. Um, and that a lot of people do come to look at the department for um, data surrounding infant mortality. So while the position was originally funded through um, Spectrum Health Resources, 
that was going to be phased out. And then there's conversations in the community with other partners and other health systems on where this type of position um, should fall and where um, it would make sense for the position to be in terms of um, larger infant mortality initiatives and prevention. So a decision was made that um, we would explore what this would look like um, within the Kent County Health Department. And then the marriage dollars provided the means for um, us to consider how we could fund that position and to make it more sustainable longer term. So that's the history of the position. So it's um, in reestablishing it. The position itself doesn't change. Uh, the health department has had a number of staff engaged on the fetal infant mortality review process all throughout. It just brings the position um, back under um, uh, the staffing that are currently serving on the fetal infant mortality review process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Skaggs, uh, you had your hand up, and I know that you sit on the allocation committee, so maybe have some perspective. Yes, thank you, Chair. So that was the reason that I had my hand up. Uh, as everyone saw in their packet, this was a, a grant that came from the, the Ready by Five Millage and uh, Allocation Committee um, back to uh, the Health Department. So um, just wanted to, to make that clear to everyone. Obviously, this is something uh, that as Teresa mentioned, you know, has been something that the, the people in the space of uh, children's health and development have been working on for years. And obviously we've had some disparities in, uh, in outcomes uh, on, on infant uh, mortality rates uh, and have been working to drive those down and been fairly successful at those. So uh, this was a, a grant proposal from the health department that we uh, decided to fund um, you know, in order to be able to continue to make uh, data-driven uh, decisions on how best to, uh, to save lives uh, of infants and, and, and bring down those statistics um, because it has a real impact on, on real human beings. So obviously support this and uh, uh, look forward to the health department taking the lead on it and, uh, and making sure that we're uh, able to help people. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, I had mentioned that uh, this is for the 2021 year grant. Uh, I believe that the allocation committee has been looking at two year cycles. Uh, there is at least in the in the works a proposal for funding this next year again. I believe this was a two year agreement. So is it a two year contract? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so next year we'll come back again and, and allocate those dollars via the budget process is what, how that would work, Commissioner. So if we pass this resolution, it only covers commitment for this year or it covers the commitment for two years? This is through the period of 2020-21 is what I'm reading here. So help me, staff, if there's a difference here, and if it is, we'll correct it. But I, I was under the impression it was for 2020-21. I'm sorry, it is the 2020-21 health fund budget. So that means this, this budget year, this 2020-21 year. All right, thank you for that clarification. All right, any other questions? If not, uh, Pam, would you take the roll? Commissioner Burrell. Yes. Commissioner Hennessy. Yes. Commissioner Common. Yes. Commissioner LeGrand. Yes. Commissioner McLeod. Yes. Commissioner Hansen. Yes. Commissioner Skaggs. Yes. Cecile. Yes. Chair Steph. Yes. That motion passes. All right, great. Uh, let's move to item number six, miscellaneous. Uh, does any member have a miscellaneous item? Mr. Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Stack. So I just wanted to give you, Stan, a little update. So we met previous to this meeting this morning uh, to review the applications for the opening on the pension board. We've kind of worked our list down that had 11 really good applicants. So I want to thank 
Natasha and Pam for the work they did of getting the word out. I know the uh, pension department was also trying to get the word out about that opening. So we've got uh, four really great choices that we're gonna interview for that position and we will have that ready for the next LHR for approval. So the pension board can be fully staffed. Great, thank you for that report. Anyone else? If not, uh, again, just to follow up on Commissioner Ponstein's uh, report, I had asked uh, Commissioner Ponstein, uh, Commissioner Teal, and Commissioner Hennessy to serve as a interview team to evaluate the applications for the open position on the pension board, which obviously they have followed up and have been uh, actively working doing. So thank you for that. Um, one other uh, item, uh, as uh, most of you know, one of the key functions of this committee is to uh, do the review uh, analysis and recommendations on our legislative priorities. Uh, uh, that is uh, not to identify everything that's of interest to the uh, county and to the commission, but certainly to identify those that are our key priorities. Uh, as uh, furtherance of that process, uh, there is a memorandum and I don't know, Wayman, did the memorandum go out yet or are we sending it out today? Yes, uh, it did yesterday. Okay, so again, just following it up, uh, make sure that if you haven't seen it, look in your, uh, in your email boxes for this memorandum. Basically, it, uh, it invites you to, uh, to consider whether you think there are particular issues, legislative issues that we should uh, take up uh, and consider uh, in this process. I'd like to have your thoughts uh, and uh, proposed considerations to us by February 5. I know that that's a short time, but really for us to effectively do this uh, and be able to uh, move forward with the legislature, we'd like to have that uh, in place, have our legislative priorities in place by the end of uh, February, no later than the first part of March. So if we can get those uh, into me by uh, February 5, we'll then distill through that and um, and be able to uh, set up a structure for a work session uh, for us to go forward and looking and talking about this on, uh, let's see, I think the first work session is scheduled for February um, 11. 23rd, 23rd, 11. 23rd. I'm sorry, the first one is the 11th. First yes. One. yes. We talked about one and then we said, uh, let's set it for two. So first one is February 11 at 5 p.m. Uh, note, I think that's our evening board of commissioners meeting. So this would be an hour before the scheduled board of commissioners meeting. Correct. And then a second one is set for February 23 at 7.30 a.m. Gotta love it. Um, and uh, see if we can get through this process at that point uh, with an idea of trying to get these approved in the February meeting at the LHR and then on to the full board after that. So, um, any questions on um, that? Yeah, just one, Stan. This is Phil. Yes. yes. Um, thanks, Stan, for getting that out to us. Um, just Pam, did that go out to every commissioner or just members of LHR? The email went to the full board. It went to the yes. full board at 444 yesterday. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's that's correct, because I think it's uh, our intention is that we'd let all the board members have a uh, say about this, obviously, as uh, it is, uh, it's a flexible document, but it's gonna be easier if we can get any commissioner's input uh, as we get into the work sessions. Great, good to hear. Okay, well, gear up for that. February is legislative priority month. So uh, hopefully we'll get through that in time and, uh, and have uh, the opportunity then to move on with our legislators and um, see if we can have an influence. Some of us have a leg up on that, Commissioner LeGrant, and having influences with <laughs> legislators, but and, and Commissioner Skaggs. So. Um, the other thing is, uh, we're also going to be scheduling a work session uh, for the Legislative Human Resource Committee to take another uh, hard look at our oversight responsibility. Uh, one of the functions that we serve is to uh, is to take these reports, these. Um, reviews like we received this morning from our clerk. Uh, and uh, we have thought it would be valuable to settle time aside to just talk a bit about what's the full extent of our responsibility and our role uh, as commissioners in providing that oversight. And then maybe a little follow-up on uh, are there mechanisms, are there structures that may be more useful, more valuable 
uh, for us in doing that oversight. So we're going to try to schedule that. I think that is uh, set for the 23rd as well, depending upon whether or not we need to do legislative priorities or if we can move into this. Great. Okay. Um, anything else from any members? I don't see it. So thank you all for your time and uh, participation and we are adjourned.